Hello and welcome back to the AHF. Today I'm going to be talking about sabres, their origins, uh, how we use them, how they sort of uh, we use throughout the world, different varieties through different cultures. This is one of my personal favourites which I bring out all the time because it's representative of one of the core weapons that we study in the club. This is a British Napoleonic infantry officer's sabre. But I really want to look at, uh, as I said, is the sort of use of the sabre throughout the whole world and, and how it relates to so many different regions. Um, ultimately, the sabre is quite possibly the most widespread sword, a sword in human history, to the level that it spread to most sort of corners of the world, ultimately. But um, going back to sort of its origin, the sabre likely originated in Hungary. Um, there's a bit of argument as to roughly in that region exactly where it originated, but certainly there are some great examples from Hungary around about the 9th and 10th century. And you see in that sort of area, and you get sort of Turkey as well, they're very popular initially, sort of quite early on down there, and it just sort of spreads um, in every direction from that sort of region of the world, and eventually to most of the world. Uh, certainly by the sort of 18th, 19th century, you see them in most corners of the world in, in one format or another. Now, of course, first of all, we have to decide what actually is a sabre. Now, there are two-handed sabres, but you would normally classify them as something specific as a two-handed sabre. So, for example, if you look at the, um, the Swiss sabre, typically of the 16th century, that is often a two-handed sabre. Um, some Japanese swords you might call a two-handed sabre, although some of them are a little bit too short, so it would often be considered more sort of a two-handed cutlass. And there you go, there's another term, the cutlass, which we're going to go on to in a little bit. So, um, another issue that comes into, uh, into play is the um, modern sports sabre seen in Olympic fencing, which is this. Now, a lot of people have come to know, know this as a sabre or even a rapier, and the reason for that is, is well, one, because in sport fencing they do call it a sabre, and two, in movies, uh, particularly in the sort of 50s and 60s, you see a lot of fight scenes done with sport sabres like this, representing either some kind of actual military sabre or sometimes even a rapier in some sort of uh, movies. So, today, uh, a lot of people see it as this um, sport sabre, which is uh, quite a, a modern, safe, very, very lightweight fencing weapon, which of course is completely straight. Um, for other people, they would consider a cavalry sword to be a sabre. And that's a shame, it's a bit of a misconception that the sabre is a cavalry weapon. Now, it was very, very popular with the cavalry. So, uh, one of the most famous examples is the British Napoleonic 1796 light cavalry sabre. And this is a very, very famous sword, probably the most famous British pattern sword, I would think, um, certainly one of, and it was known to be one of the best, if not the best, British swords ever made. Um, and yes, this is a light cavalry weapon. However, as you can see with the sword I showed you at the start, this is an infantry officer's sword, and yet looks remarkably similar, and there's a good reason for that, which we're going to go on to in a bit. So, <clears throat> the sabre, it isn't unique to um, cavalry by any means. Uh, it is normally, we're just going to call it a sabre, it would be a one-handed sword and with a curved blade, or what some people would call a curved back sword. Um, a back sword is just a single-edged sword, and you see single-edged swords used throughout all kinds of periods. You, know, you can see, for example, Viking swords. You'll see a lot of Viking swords that are single-edged. People often uh, refer, refer, them, <laughs> sorry, refer to them today as um, berserker swords and things like that, which is you know, quite a modern term. But yeah, you'll see loads of single-hand, uh, sorry, single-edged Viking swords. You can go up into the 16th century or even 15th century and see lots of single-edged swords in, say, Italy. There were a lot of uh, like side sword type things that had single-edged blades. A lot of English swords that were using single-edged um, blades, whether it was sort of simple S-guard swords, commonly associated with archers and things like that, through to basket-hilted swords of the 16th century. But the sabre is effectively that back sword blade, but made curved. So um, there's our, our sort of rough definition, is a one-handed curved sword. But also we have to consider size. Uh, and the reason for that is what happens when we get down to things like this, which fits the original uh, classification I just gave you of one-handed curved sword. Um, and this would normally not be called a sabre, this would be called a cutlass or a hanger. Cutlass normally being a, a naval term and hanger being um, an army or, or sort of infantry term. However, those terms were also used interchangeably, so um, you'll see quite a mix. Um, in terms of blade length, how we classify which is the shorter weapon, the hanger or cutlass, to what is the longer sabre, 
there's no exact sort of number for it, but approximately it's around about over and under 30 inch blade lengths. So roughly 30 and under is, is a cutlass and roughly over that is a sabre. But you will see a few examples either side of that, but that's a, a sort of rough boundary, which is why you can see um, some sources in the 19th century calling the katana, it's British sort of a, uh, sources that came across the katana, they called them a two-handed cutlass because a, a katana is normally around about 26 to 28 and a half inch blade length so it would fit firmly into this um, size of sword, the uh, cutlass or the hanger. So uh, there you go, there's our classification. A one-handed curved sword that has a blade length of around about 30 inch or more. And that's it. In terms of the hilt, they can vary immensely. A sabre could have anything from just a straight quillon, like a, a traditional medieval arming sword, all the way up to full knuckle bows and full basket hilts. So you'll see an immense variety of hilt types. So you can't really begin to classify a sabre as to what it has on the actual hilt. That can vary massively. Um, you know, you look, for example, to um, an Indian talwa, which is most definitely a sabre, and that doesn't have any of the hand protection that we associate with um, later sort of British swords, for example. So that's um, how we're going to sort of classify what a sabre is. Um, the term probably came from uh, the term shabla, which is the Eastern European term. You'll see it in Polish uh, and Hungary, Hungarian. And um, the, the issue is in Britain, because that's where I'm going to look at most, of course, because we study um, British military swordsmanship, so that's our real core interest. But I'm going to look at it in a broader subject as well, but always coming back to its association with Britain. The sabre came quite late to Britain. Realistically, it wasn't known um, commonly until the 17th century, and you don't see it in really common usage until the 18th century, um, which of course is a long way um, forward compared to what I said earlier on about seeing these Hungarian sources in the 9th and 10th century. You'll see loads of sabres being used through the Crusades, for example. So you'll see an awful lot of different sabres in use, and also by the um, Byzantines or Byzantines as well, so the late Romans, which uh, of course ended in the uh, mid 15th century. So they were using versions of sabres as well. So yeah, the sabre came really quite late to Britain. Not that you wouldn't see any curved swords before then, but they just weren't that common. So uh, yeah, when you get into the 18th century, that's when they became really quite common in Britain. Uh, look into a few other sort of regions. Well, the sabre today, of course, is very, very popular and very famous with the Poles and the Hungarians. Now, they were using a sword that very much resembled the uh, British Light Cavalry uh, sabre. A lot of them had um, a thumb ring here, which is um, excellent for uh, getting good grip with the thumb and edge alignment and power and all kinds of things. Um, but not all. Some had and some didn't. The blade profile there is really quite characteristic of a lot of um, Eastern European sabres and the overall protection offered here again is very much the same so this is a really good representation of the kind of thing being used in Eastern Europe from around about the sort of 16th or 17th century onwards until eventually they moved on to um, more developed hilts as well. But saying that they did go back or stay in many parts with these basic stirrup hilts that we call them so this never actually disappeared. They didn't just evolve into big baskets or ball hilts and never use stirrups anymore. Um, and if you look to a lot of sabres used right up into the mid 20th century, they were still using uh, stirrup hilts. Which takes us on to when did the sabre realistically die out? Well, ultimately in British service, um, the swords eventually went straight. So this um, is a... Uh, First World War trooper's sword and some people would call this a sabre still, it's not. It's completely straight. In fact it's more like a short lance than it is um, a sabre and doesn't have a lot in common anymore with a sabre. But um, you can see right at the end of the 19th century and going into the early 20th pretty much all British swords were replaced with straight blades that were going to be thrust orientated both for infantry and cavalry. So that's where it died out in Britain. However, um, curved blades remained popular throughout much of the world until swords completely fell out of use, which was the last use was realistically the Second World War. There were a few small incidents, 
but realistically the start of the First World War was the end in most regions of the world for any kind of sword use. So you see that time period of the um, of how the saber was used, you're talking about something like a thousand years of history. So you can see how widespread it was and you can see how many nations it spread to. There we go, so we've looked at kind of what the Eastern European sabers would have looked like, or at least at one particular time period. Um, I did bring in a tulwar, which is a characteristically Indian uh, sabre, which was used for hundreds of years as well. Now, this is a classic form of tulwar. They typically do have this dish at the bottom. Some of them will have knuckle bows, some of them have fuller blades, this one doesn't. So they can vary quite a bit, but this is um, a very, very typical example. This one's probably from the mid 19th century. Uh, how different is that to British sabres? Well, the curvature of the blade is similar to many of them, particularly from the Napoleonic time period. The length is typical of a lot of British swords, and the hand protection, as you can see, is a little bit less on this one because there's no knuckle bow, although some would have had that as well. So that's just a quick look at the Tolwa. Uh, on to something a little bit more curved and a bit more outrageous, the Shamshir, which is typically thought of as um, Persian, and you think of, it, think of it as sort of an Ottoman sword. This one uh, may well be from India, where they were starting to make them as well. But even so, it's typical of sort of Persian swords. And as with most sh many Shamshirs, they are outrageously curved. And this also influenced swords in the Napoleonic time in Britain. So you can see this type of sabre with this kind of blade on it. So a slightly thinner um, profile but much more curved. And you will see this exact type of blade on this type of hilt and various other non-pattern and non-regulation British swords as well. So that, certainly that became common. And, and, and this hilt, this Shamshir style hilt, that also caught on uh, in Europe as well, uh, mainly after Napoleon's contact in, in Egypt. And that made it very, very popular throughout uh, European power. So you'll see this kind of hilt being used even today for, um, uh, just sort of um, ornamental purposes for the militaries today with the British military and the Americans and the French so it's still popular for some ceremonial use today. So that's a Shamshir. Okay so uh, we take it back to I would say cavalry swords for a moment. Now probably the most famous cavalry sword for the British after the 1796 Light Cavalry, which is an exceptional sabre, is the 1796 Heavy Cavalry. And this is the sword which was famously used in the novels uh, by Bernard Cornwall for Richard Sharp and in the films as well. And the first thing you notice about this sword is it is straight, completely straight. In fact, it's an iron bar with a hilt attached to it. Um, this we wouldn't call a, a sabre. You could call it a straight sabre if you like, but there might be an oxymoron. It's typically called a palash, this kind of sword, and was copied from the Austrians. And these kinds of long, because it is very long, I think it's a 34 inch blade, so it's quite long compared to most of the Napoleonic swords for the British. And it became very, very common, this type of sword, for heavy cavalry in the 18th and going into the 19th century. And yes, it's much more a brutish, um, brawling sort of instrument than the much faster um, what we'd call hazard blades with things like the light cavalry because this type of blade became very very popular from the hazards that you get instead of Hungary and the principle was light cavalry that moved at high speed that were able to harass artillery, fleeing infantry and that kind of thing so as opposed to the real blunt force sort of um, instrument that the heavy cavalry are, the light cavalry, incredibly fast, incredibly agile, with a sword that's well suited to the job like this. I know this is the infantry version. And that takes us back to comparing them, the um, sort of infantry and cavalry versions of these swords. Well, the reason this came about, this is the 1803 pattern infantry sword, is because infantry officers started to carry these, which was frowned upon, because they shouldn't have been carry carrying them because they were a cavalry blade. Um, what happened is in Napoleonics is troops started to use more skirmishing tactics and the officers found themselves uh, frequently out in smaller numbers and by themselves and having to defend themselves and they needed a sword that was better suited to the job, of which the spadroon was awful. So they started carrying these, the army eventually gave in very quickly actually and gave them a sword that was 
effectively as good as a fighting blade, but looked a bit nicer and better suited to their station. And these two blades actually look almost identical. Um, they are the same length, they're the same curvature. The only difference you see is the um, profile of the blade towards the tip is broader on my light cavalry. Now, this 1803 pattern, although they had a regulation length, a lot of officers didn't keep to it. So this one is a full length, same as the uh, light cavalry, but they also had more curve, they had less curve, they had all kinds of things that were non-regulation with these blades, but this one's a nice classic regulation type example. Um, but what it does to the sword is, this is a 900 gram cavalry sword, but by just changing the profile of the blade slightly, they've reduced this down to just over 800. It has lost almost 100 grams, even though it's got slightly more hand protection, so it's got a slightly better hilt, and they've taken weight out of the blade to make it a bit more agile, and slightly better suited to infantry combat. So that's a quick look at uh, the infantry and cavalry um, for the Napoleonics uh, with the British. Go on to a few other things, because we have got to look at a few other cultures before we go back to the British. Um, we go on to the Japanese. Now, of course, the Japanese were um, very much isolationists, and it took them a long time to move on to the kind of Western um, uh, sort of industrialization of the 19th century that they did. And when they did, they started to develop swords that were European-inspired. And this effectively is exactly what it looks like. It is a katana, but with a European-themed hilt on it. Um, and this became a common pattern for infantry and cavalry use within the Japanese army until they started to revert back to um, katanas uh, as they basically brought back their kind of samurai um, heritage and culture, particularly um, leading up to the Second World War. But these lasted for quite a few decades. So, um, yeah, a hybrid between katana and European sabre. So, that's another part of the world that the sabre reached. Another example would be the Chinese um, broadsword, the Chinese Dao, which is a Chinese sabre. Now, this example is exactly the same length as the hanger or cutlass that I showed you earlier on. So, technically, you might consider this too small to be a sabre. Um, the person I would borrow this from, he does practice Chinese martial arts, and we did talk about this quite a bit. There's quite a lot of variety with these Chinese sabres, a massive amount, to be honest. So you can have massively varied blade lengths and curvatures and different blade profiles. So they, they could be very, very broad, heavy cutters towards the tip. They could be much finer. They could be longer and more curved and all sorts. So, and also consider that um, Chinese and Japanese peoples um, were a lot shorter on average than Europeans when you go back a few hundred years. Um, the difference has actually decreased um, in the last 100 to 150 years, but certainly a few hundred years ago, you might expect on average um, a height difference of approximately five or six inches between, say, Chinese and Japanese going to sort of Northern Europeans. So even though this is on the boundary for what we might consider a sabre, for the um, peoples who were using them at the time, this may well have been a sabre, and uh, certainly I would consider it a sabre. It's quite a meaty blade. So yeah, um, Chinese sabre. Another example of a very, very popular sabre in the world. And we go on to um, sort of a middle period that I haven't discussed for the British, which is the rest of the 19th century. I talked about the Napoleonics towards the start, and I moved on to the end where we went to straight blades for the infantry and the cavalry. But what about that huge time period in, bet in between, particularly with all of Britain's small wars that were fought in that time as well? Well, we were using sabres there as well, but they got a hell of a lot straighter. So this is a rifle officer's sword, and um, you can see it's only very, very lightly curved, but still definitely classifies as a sabre because it is curved and single-edged. And um, this type of sword, roughly this kind of hilt, came in in 1822. This one um, with steel a little bit later, but they were used from the early 1820s up until almost the end of the 19th century when um, straight blades replaced them. Uh, with more thrust orientated um, uh, sort of techniques and bowl style hilts. So that's a look at an infantry sabre throughout the sort of most of the basically most of the Victorian period. And you can see just for completeness the infantry version here of that same sword. So this was what came in in 1822, the pike back blade, which is another form of um, back edge. And again, light curvature. Brass guard, 
So that's um, 1822 onwards, that's a nice brass infantry hilt, infantry sort of sword. And I think I have covered the vast majority. Ah, there are a few that I haven't. You see, going into the mid 19th century, these bowls developing. This is the kind of guard that you always see today on training swords that we use, for example, from Peter Rugeni. And the reason is, is that these often were used for training purposes because they are incredibly tough and they're just single piece metal um, shaped and they're what we call a bowl guard, incredibly strong. So this is from 1864 onwards, uh, nice strong bowls being developed and this is a cavalry sword. The infantry um, uh, hilts at the same time were much lighter and much prettier to look at. Again, um, how tough do most swords need to be? Well, not more, not sort of tough enough to last more than one or two battles. So you can have a nice ornate hilt like, um, like this, which will only withstand a few blows. Well, that's all you need it to, so that's fine. Right, I think I've given you quite a rambling, good sort of overview of the sabre. So in the kind of context we use it in, British sabre, is you're talking about it becoming really popular somewhere in the early to mid 18th century. So certainly by the time you get to the um, sort of War of Independence of the Americans, you're seeing a lot of sabres in use by that point. And soon after, they became regulation patterns. And going into the Napoleonics, it was all regimented and regulated. Of course, still plenty of people had non pattern swords. And you see the sabres being used for the British all the way up to the end of the 19th century and just about into the 20th of some and a little bit further on for other cultures. So uh, there's a good overview. Now, the sabre, what makes it so great as a weapon? Why did it spread so far? Well, um, the first thing is when you make a blade curved, it will slice better, um, which is a nice effect of having a curved blade. So if you are fighting in um, an unarmoured situation, or partially armoured, where you have target zones that you can strike that aren't armoured, the curved blade does slice a little bit better than the straight blade. Although what we have found is the, um, the kind of trauma it delivers is a little bit less than some of the straight blades, which might explain why some of the um, straight blades that the Palash were so popular with heavy cavalry units is that the blunt force trauma they could deliver was absolutely vast. The Sabre is also incredibly comfortable and easy to wear. Natural curvature makes it really comfortable to um, curve around the body. It allows kneeling down, like for example, a light infantryman might need to. Really good. It doesn't stick in the ground. It doesn't get in the way. Um, when you're in sort of close formations or in or in close spaces, the curvature actually curves around your body in ways that make it quite useful in more confined spaces or again with information type stuff. And also, you find as you use curved blades that they can deflect energy away from the hand in ways that some some straight blades don't. You'll also find that some thrusting techniques become incredibly useful with curved blades. Initially, if you've only used straight, you'll find that trying to land thrusts can actually be really quite difficult because at different angles, the curvature can just pull off in weird directions. But actually, you can use that as an advantage. So you can engage, for example, on outside line guard. And as you actually drive through, you can twist in supreme or first guard and the tip with the curvature just drops in over the opponent's blade. And that's the kind of thing you'll see a lot if you look to some of the uh, Iranian sword and buckler stuff that's been put on uh, YouTube recently. And they're using that curvature actually in sword and buckler scenarios to work around offhand weapons, which is another great advantage of curved blades. Going on to cavalry, when you are using kind of hazard style light cavalry that are fighting at, a, you know, basically at a gallop at high speed a lot of the time, the curved blade slices through nicely and doesn't get stuck in your opponent so easily. So again, when you're fighting at speed, it's quite an advantage. So you see some really great features of curved blades. Um, the downside to them is that for some um, armoured fighting, they're not so good. With armoured fighting, you need to be a little bit more precise for going for uh, weak points, particularly when you're talking about full armour. And that's therefore not surprising when you see a lot of the armies that came up from, um, uh, for example, with Turkey and some of the, uh, the Moors that were fighting in Spain, is a lot of the time when they came up against armour, they were going on to straight bladed swords. And then you see things like uh, the Panzerstetscher or stocks being developed, which are best suited to armoured combat. Ultimately, ultimately remember, of course, that most of the time, in most parts of history, the sword was not the primary weapon. It's a weapon, depending on the time period, as a dueling weapon, a weapon for self-defence, or a secondary weapon on the battlefield. And 
in those kind of roles, as well as later on when you see armies dropping armor all together, the Sabre really excelled. So um, there's a good sort of overview to the Sabre. So I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you get anything from this video, I would say get out there and do some Sabre training, whether it is European, specifically British, Polish, Iranian, Chinese, just go and do some Sabre training. It's an absolute fascinating subject, so uh, get into it, and I hope you enjoy the video.